come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream to. Look out, New York World's Fair. Here comes Walt Disney. The magician of Disneyland is shipping off to the fair. Astonishing exhibits that bid to be the most eye-popping in the history of world fairs. And that's not forgetting the Ferris wheel either. But most impressive of all of Disney's contributions to the fair is Pepsi Cola's It's a Small World Salute to the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. It's a lengthy boat ride indoors into fantasy along the seven seaways of the world. Both sides of the waterway are crowded with animated figures of children representing 100 countries and areas of the world. A riot of color, humor, and action greet the visitor's eye as the plastic moppets provide a musical fantasy, dancing, singing, cavorting, and playing fanciful instruments. Disneyland itself has nothing to compare. Vernon Scott, The Press Tribune, January 31st, 1964. Walt Disney had his team of Imagineers create four attractions for the 1964 World's Fair, each highlighting a different range of their audio animatronics capabilities. In addition to It's a Small World, there were the dinosaurs from the Ford Motor Company's Magic Skyway, the Carousel of Progress in General Electric's Progress Land, and the Illinois Pavilion's groundbreaking Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln all proved hugely popular and successful to fairgoers, much to the relief of Disney himself. The purpose of the fair, in one regard, for Walt, was to see if there was going to be a viability of audience for an expansion eastward of Disneyland. During these efforts, Walt becomes concerned that maybe he's misjudged the East Coast. He's lived in the Midwest, he's lived in the West, but he feels that maybe he doesn't have the exact pulse of the New York and the New England area. And he wants to make sure that this is going to be a profitable project before he jumps fully into it. And the World's Fair tells him that, yes, the East Coast is going to come to Disneyland-style entertainment as well. With corporate sponsors underwriting the development and construction of the attractions, Disney knew that once the fair was over, he would own them outright. It was necessary then, early on, to make sure that each attraction had an all-star team of Imagineers to bring them into existence. In addition to the Sherman Brothers theme song for It's a Small World, Disney tapped Mary Blair, Mark and Alice Davis, Blaine Gibson, and Roly Crump to create something spectacular in just 11 months. Amid the hustle and bustle at WED, Ken Forsey did his best to help wherever and whenever he could. He was part of the team who painted the dolls and the animals, which would inhabit the canals of the happiest little crews that ever sailed round the world. When it came time to ship everything to the fairgrounds, Ken would follow along, ready to reassemble and perform regular maintenance on the attractions. I remember working till two or three o'clock in the morning, helping maintain the ride. You know, what happened was, which is really strange, the ride was on one switch. The one switch turned the ride on, turned the music on, and what happened was we'd go out there and we'd have to leave the switch on because that's the only way you could get the animation to work. And then you try to put a hat back on somebody that came off while the little guy is moving. 
was kind of a nightmare. And I can't believe that they had all of that on one switch. So every night, Ken had to wash the faces of the dolls and repaint all the dolls. Well, during that time, they were playing It's a Small World after all, but at night they would play it backwards. So he learned that It's a Small World song forward and backwards. He kind of shuddered whenever he'd, he'd hear it after that because he'd heard it so many times. You know, whenever the ride broke down, the music didn't stop. And so you'd be sitting in the boat in the dark and then the music would keep playing and it'd drive you crazy. Yeah, we all got a little bit sick of it's a small world after all. I am repeatedly asked for a definition of the fair and a guide to its wonders. What indeed is a fair? A fair is an Olympics of progress. It spells mass production, the amazing fruits of the Industrial Revolution, the hopes and triumphs of the democratic process, a baffling search for common international ground, temples of religion and prayer, the march of science around the globe and into space, the arts from primitive to abstract, the wealth of Ormus and Ind, the jewels of the Count of Monte Cristo, cargoes of ivory, apes and peacocks, food and wine from the terrace club to the brass rail, and amusement in a thousand guises. Whatever man has thought and wrought, we have it. Something for all to last them through their lives. In simple terms, using superlatives only where they are provable and justified. The New York World's Fair is the greatest fair in history. Robert Moses. The fair officially opened on April 22, 1964, its first season coming to a close that following October. Ken would have been there from the start, but once he had helped ensure that the Disney attractions looked their very possible best, it was time to head back west due to a very pressing engagement. A Boulder Creek boy is making good. Charles Chuck Fuson, who went to Hollywood some months ago to accept a position with the Walt Disney Studios, has just been promoted to the position of assistant to Pluto's animator. Fuson, who is now residing at Glendale, is the son of Mrs. May Fuson, Santa Cruz Evening News, July 8th, 1940. Chuck Fusen would work in the animation department, the comics division, and Imagineering until 1968 when he retired to focus on his passion for watercolors. He married his wife Phyllis shortly after starting his career with Disney. They welcomed a daughter on May 13th, 1942. Her name was Wendy. My dad was working for Disney for the studios and my mom was a secretary for the studios and my dad had to deliver something over to where my mom was working and he walked in the door and saw my mom sitting there and so the story goes he said to her I'm gonna marry you and sure enough they got married. <laughs> We're told we should not love possessions yet are we not here to create? The things that we build for each other allow us to communicate. Our tools without love are unworthy, yet love also must have a form. If love is the tool of creation, then what we create will transform. Ken and Wendy were married on September 12, 1964, and before the decade was over, would adopt two children, a son Christopher in 1966, and a daughter Teresa in 1969. My mom was a very kind, sincere, loving person. She was the huggy, lovey, cuddles person, and she took care of the day-to-day -day raising of my brother and I, and took us to our soccer practice, and she was the Girl Scout mom, and the soccer mom, and the snack mom, and worked in the office at our school, and she was my confidant, my best friend. With his own experience of having been the child of a much older father, Ken approached parenthood in terms of what would best benefit his children in the long run. With Wendy serving as the emotional support, Ken took what he saw as a more practical approach to raising Christopher and Teresa. He wasn't the soccer dad or the softball or go to the swim meet kind of dad. He didn't get involved like the other moms or dads may with our school activities. He took a different approach in teaching my brother and I life skills. He taught us how to hang drywall when we were building an addition to the house or he made sure that we were by his side if he was fixing a toilet or a drippy faucet, painting the house or fixing the roof, my brother would be up there learning how to do that with him. And at the same time, making sure that we were creative and silly and he would sit down with us and have us sing silly songs that we would make up 
he instilled in us though that if you're gonna do something, anything, you needed to do it well and you needed to build mastery around it. If you set your mind to something and you had the tools and the information that you needed that you could accomplish great things and he expected that of my brother and I whether we were doing the dishes or doing school homework, writing a paper, doing an art project, that we needed to do things well, but also he taught us how you could have fun doing it. Whether fabricating Halloween costumes for Christopher and Teresa or surprising them with decorated Easter eggs, Ken was showing his children that just because they would have to grow up one day, it did not mean they had to forget how to enjoy themselves. Indeed, the benefits of having a father who was an Imagineer proved to be quite entertaining and humorous. So my brother and I went to a private school and in grade school, the kids tried to petition that our projects were never allowed to be judged because dad would work with us many hours teaching us how to do different techniques to create our science fair projects. And all the kids thought that he had done our projects for us when in fact he just took the time to teach us how to do things so they looked very professional in nature compared to the other kids our age. When teachable moments presented themselves, Ken did not hesitate to reveal his eccentric side, incorporating art in order to convey the lesson. My dad was very graphic as far as showing us and teaching us things and being specific. And one of the big things was, I would always say, I'm gonna go get on my shoes. And he's like, you don't get on your shoes, you put on your shoes. It couldn't get me to quit saying I was gonna get on my shoes. So he drew a picture side by side of a little girl standing on her shoes and one with her with the shoes on. And he says, if you get on your shoes, you're standing on them. And if you put on your shoes, they go on your feet. And he just drew a really crazy cartoon about it to get the point across to me and it was really, really good memory. Seen by 10.3 million persons at the New York World's Fair, It's a Small World has been lengthened with the addition of new lands, so that this enchanted world of children is now inhabited by doll-like youngsters from more than 100 nations and areas of the globe. It's also housed in a new palace-like building, basically white with varying textures and soft blue tones, and trimmed in gold leaf. Highlighting its entrance is a 30-foot clock in which animated figures of children perform the time every 15 minutes to a happy children's arrangement of the small world theme song and the discordant sounds of the clock's conglomeration of gears, springs, and cogs. Kermit Holt, the Chicago Tribune. For the World's Fair, Walt Disney had wanted It's a Small World's Pavilion to have a visual magnet to entice fairgoers to set sail with his several hundred singing dolls. The job fell to Roly Crump, whose only instructions were that the boss wanted it to be a tower. The result was the Tower of the Four Winds, a 12-story kinetic sculpture of three primary columns and four slender buttresses with 100 spinning, swiveling, oscillating elements of as many colors and shapes and propellers of every description and size. Rowley considered the project near and dear to his heart, and although it did exactly what Disney had wanted it to do, when the time came for the attraction to be transplanted to Disneyland, the Tower of the Four Winds would not be joining it. We had already built the facade and the entrance to Small World at Disneyland. What happened was, as boats went into the ride, there was a platform underneath where they went in, and it was a large platform. And Walt asked me one time, Roly, what are you going to put on that platform? And I said, God, I don't know. Maybe we'll have a little orchestra come there and play once in a while, or a band or something, and do that on that little platform. And Walt said, no. He says, what I think we'll do is I think we'll do a clock. And I said, oh, okay, great, we'll do a clock. So immediately I called Mary Blair and I said, I need a sketch of what a small world clock would look like, which she did. She sent it back to me almost immediately. And so I took that and I built a little model from that representing the three-dimensional aspect of the facade, showed it to Walt. Walt bought off on it, said, great, let's go with it. Well, somewhere along the line, they decided to do a working model on that clock. So I was told that we have to do a little model that actually functions so Walt can take a look at it. 
because he already bought off on it as a clock. So I got Ken because I knew Ken was going to animate anything that I designed. He and I started working together as a team, and Ken went into designing everything that would animate in this model, as well as having the music playing with it. When the working model of the clock was completed, the Imagineers anxiously awaited their boss's inspection. When given the signal by Rowley, Ken turned it on and let the pre-programmed sequence play out. Well, Dick Irvine came up to Walt and said, you know, Walt, he said, I think we should put Mark Davis on it, redesign it, because it doesn't have the old world charm. And Walt looked at Dick Irvine straight in the eye and said, I like it exactly the way it is. And so that took care of that. Perhaps you wonder, as I sometimes do, where the past 10 years have gone. Ten years ago next month, Disneyland opened its gates for the first time. In Town Square, we unveiled the dedicated plaque that symbolizes the warm and friendly spirit of our Magic Kingdom. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. We've had a lot of fun playing host to you and your family. Now we are embarking on our second decade, and it promises to be even more exciting than the first. In fact, we are already creating and designing new attractions for almost every year in the next ten. As I said on the Magic Kingdom's opening day, Disneyland will never be completed, as long as there is imagination left in the world. Walt Disney, June 14th, 1965. Walt wanted the clock there to show off at the Christmas party, and so everybody was enjoying themselves, and I had about three or four martinis, so I was having a great time. And Walt was there to introduce the clock. Well, what happened was we ran the clock for everybody that came to begin with. And then when we got finished with it, they came to me and they said, Walt wants to run the clock. I said, have Ken run it because I've said I've too many martinis I can't get involved. Yeah, no, I couldn't run it without him. It was kind of a tricky little thing to run. So I backed out and Ken took over and ran the clock for Walt. You know, Walt really loved Ken. He was the father of the clock. After getting married, the new Mr. and Mrs. Forsey purchased a home in Granada Hills. Ken made sure that whichever house was picked had to have a sizable garage. Tired of having no workspace to call his own, it was important to him to have a refuge in which to create as he saw fit. His goal, however, was to raise funds for the puppet show he had been slowly working on. The adventures of Simeon Greep, as Ken envisioned it, was not going to be cheap, so he needed extra income. Every time you met Kim, it was magical because he had invented something new that was just amazing. For, so for me as a kid to, to say, oh, we're going to go over to Ken's house or go to Ken's garage, you knew you were in for a surprise and you were going to see something that was fantastic. And funny enough, when we moved from our first house in Encino to another house in Granada Hills, we found out that we had moved like two blocks away from Ken. We didn't know that, but they, when they contacted each other, we found out and it was just like, oh boy, like Christmas again. So we would go over to Ken's garage and he had things like the gorilla jumping rope, which was a fantastic illusion that he'd done, but he had this great little model of this gorilla that was skipping rope and you just couldn't figure it out because there was this thing that was free floating in space and it was absolutely perfect and wonderful and it just, oh, it was just magical. Everything was always magical with Ken. One of the many projects that Ken took on was for Leon Heller. His former employer had decided to purchase for his wife, Yvonne Punky Heller, a hamburger joint next to the Glen Oaks car wash. They christened it the Swizzle and approached Ken with the idea of redesigning the entire structure. While it ultimately proved not feasible, Due to the estimated high costs of renovations, the Swizzle model shows off Ken's approach to working within the realm of architecture. There's beauty all around us, from the heavens to the heart. When we reflect that beauty, then we choose to call it art. We have learned of nature's structure as it magically is shown. Through talent and through training, we have formed it for our own. True genius thus emerges from the talent and the toil, and monuments are built from simple wood and stone and soil. So marvelous these images that we've gathered to see, and know that they're the work of people just like you and me. But some believe, for profit, they can take their own shortcut, or that the title art includes each ugly form of smut. Expedience then takes the place of efforts of the mind, obscurity and gimmicks hide the talent we can't find. Some artists now don't feel that they should waste their time in the class, and we are told that art includes the waste that they might pass. The faker and the forger may effectively deceive us, and of our thoughts and money may successfully relieve us. But time will tell the story as it has from the start, for time is what distinguishes the nonsense from the art.
The latest addition to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk is the cave train to the Lost World, which combines the drama of the unknown with the fun of an old-fashioned train ride. It is quite an operation and has now been augmented with a second train so that in case of a breakdown, another unit is immediately available. But it also increases the riding capacity during busy days. It is filled with all sorts of electronic marvel which operate moving exhibits and set off soundtracks to enhance the fun of the ride. Some 15 amplifiers and 40 speakers are used in the sound system alone, which are all automatically operated from a dust-free electronic system room under the boardwalk. Micro switches along the train tracks set off relays as a train maneuvers through the lost world. The Santa Cruz Sentinel. Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk had been in operation for more than half a century by the time the cave train debuted. Being just far enough from Anaheim, it did not suffer the loss of revenue so many similar amusement parks of the time did when Disneyland became an overnight success in 1955. When Warren Skip Littlefield, the boardwalk's first unofficial historian, was asked what drew people to the boardwalk, he answered that it was neither rides, games, noise, nor gaiety. According to Littlefield, the traditional attraction is the beach itself. If it weren't for the beach, we might as well be in Sacramento or Yuba City. This view, of course, did not deter the boardwalk from regularly adding new attractions. It would tap Aero Development, the company responsible for six of Disneyland's opening day rides, to help maintain steady attendance records. They built the trains and I'm sure brought some design concepts to the ride in order to give us a sense of what it would look like to build it out. The notion of why cave people came from that rather rapid popularity of the Flintstones. And we could see that cave people could be humorous, especially if they were juxtaposed with modern conveniences. But there were a lot of dark spaces when that ride opened up. In 1966, it was determined that the cave train needed more content to keep visitors coming back. Records show that management contracted one Ron White to produce additional pieces for the ride. White, who may or may not have had some association with Disneyland, recruited Ken Forsey. A lot of these art directors, before they work with Disney, come in from uh, jobs that are on a project-to-project -project basis. They'll work on a film, and when it's done, they'll work on another film. They've been brought up in a system where they need to kind of manage their time and their opportunities. There's other people that are doing outside work, and so something that would have been somewhat customary for people would be to bring in photos of the work that they're doing for an outside firm. And so long as they aren't taking Disney ideas or concepts and using them on their outside job, there wouldn't have been any problem. I've talked to other people that have done this. There were also people that did it somewhat secretly. They think of themselves from their background as independent contractors. And that Disney's going to provide continuous lifetime work is a very new concept for them. Even though Ken is hired under the idea that all he's going to be doing is creating new pieces for the cave train, He's also been working on Simeon Greep and seeing over at WED how stories can be told via a dark ride. So he wants to sort of uh, flex his riding muscles a bit. He actually proposes a revamp of the cave train. By changing the track in the suggested area, there will be room for a fairly large diorama. This diorama would be an introduction to the prehistoric world, showing dinosaurs, etc. It would also separate the tracks, allowing both trains to run at once. All of the cave scenes could be in the larger rooms, the basic theme would need to be no more than a history of cavemen. If there is narration on the train, it could be almost serious. The humor would lie in what the cavemen are doing. The primeval world was full of terrible beasts fighting and killing to survive. About this time, man appeared on the scene. Man discovered that if he was to survive, he must outthink rather than outfight. When Ken's proposal was rejected, he went to work, undeterred, making additional cave people out of fiberglass. Without any stated restrictions, he created what he thought would amuse people. The cave train is kind of stupid. That's the key to why we loved it so much. Because it was an old, broken down thing that didn't work half of the time and smelled funny and wasn't Pirates of the Caribbean by any stretch of the imagination. It was cheap, it was local, it was bad at being a ride. It was cornier than Iowa, said the Sentinel. A thrill ride without thrills. The cave train is all about happy cheesiness. Our joy in the fact that it doesn't quite measure up that it's funky and weird, that this is Santa Cruz, and we like it that way. Dana Frank. Some new music records arrived at the Hippodrome at the beach on Saturday morning, 
and delighted the large number of people who gathered at Charles Loof's new concession on the boardwalk. The merry-go-round, for such it is, though on a large scale, is now in complete operation and is indeed an ornament to the beach's attractions. Mr. Loof thoroughly understands his business, owning similar concessions throughout the country. He builds nothing cheap, nothing shoddy, but permanent substantial amusement enterprises of a dignified nature. The Santa Cruz Sentinel, August 8, 1911. The boardwalk's carousel, with its hand-carved horses, two chariots, polished brass, scores of mirrors, and elaborate decorative carvings was, and still is, an enchanting work of art. To maintain its historical significance, ownership knew better than to have the ride altered in any way. But the enclosure, which the carousel called home, needed something to catch the eyes of tourists, helping them find their way to the dazzling steeds. Ken had already done the cave people pieces by this point, and when he was given the chance to add that little bit of pop to the carousel's building, he did it his way. Not many people would have Ken's answer to this task. He figures, okay, the ride is all about riding horses, but it's located at the beach. How do you marry the two? The answer was obvious to him. The three seahorses Ken created for the boardwalk's carousel were enormous and glittering, just the type of attention grabber that was then hoped for. He cast the molds in his garage workshop and prepared them for shipping, all with the help of an assistant he had taken on for the job, Les Heller, son of Leon and Yvonne Heller. The seahorses were hoisted and secured into place atop the carousel's dome, where they have remained for over half a century. It makes me feel proud that I grew up in a household with such creativity and that the world sees it. They may not recognize the time and the effort and the hours that went into creating all of that and knowing the details behind it, but being able to see the joy on people's faces when they see the things that he created and he had a hand in brings joy to my heart as well. The building should be modern and futuristic in design. It should have enough gadgets and devices to give the public the impression of something different. Perhaps the impression of a space depot or airport. On the roof there should be a large transmitting antenna which periodically comes to life with electronic noises, flashing lights, etc. Before his time with the boardwalk came to an end, and despite the fact that his cave train revamp proposal had been rejected, Ken decided to pitch a dark ride completely of his own design. Calling it Journey to Mars, he provided detailed production notes, a basic narration, and illustrations to convey the otherworldly creatures he was envisioning. Ken's really flexing his writing muscles with this one. He's clearly becoming more confident as a storyteller. What's being proposed here is a ride that Disneyland didn't even have. It was decades ahead. He's trying to create full immersion. Welcome! You are now about to embark on Earthman's most daring adventure. The machine you see before you is our matter transmitter designed by Dr. Niles Astro. It is capable of transmitting solid matter on a beam of energy at the speed of light. Once aboard, you will be transmitted in seconds to our sister station on Mars. Ken described riders first entering an observation room prior to their own decontamination within a glass chamber. From there, they would be brought to the matter transmitter and through optical illusions and engineering ingenuity, find themselves transported to the red planet, ready to board a van type vehicle driven by a robot. Happy to have you all aboard. We now start on our unforgettable journey of the planet Mars. You'll observe many strange creatures along the way. So sit back, relax and enjoy every second of it. Be alert, however. These creatures have unpredictable ways, and especially when strangers are around. Up until last week, I was driving sand buggy number two. So if the ride's a bit rough, it's because of this new vehicle. On your left, a mountain climbing Zori. Straight up the rock wall he can go. He feeds on the rock algae. Wait a minute, up ahead folks, the charging butter beast. They'll charge anything red. Sure glad I'm not driving the red buggy. There are unlimited possibilities for unusual types of Martian animals and scenes as the ride continues. When the buggy completes the journey and returns to the loading dock, the people are now free to look around the lobby at their leisure and to have a Martian tidbit at the snack bar or return to Earth via the matter transmitter. When you look at these sketches, you see Ken is coming into his own style. 
there really isn't any Disney-esque quality to these characters, which says a lot about him as an artist. Ken really wanted this to happen. He went so far as to take the monkey-like creatures from one of his drawings and build them in his garage. Wendy's even wrangled into the whole thing, and not just helping color these things. She was his copy editor. They had a system down. It worked well for them. My mom would type up scripts and letters and books and different things that my dad had going on. Although he was very creative, everyone has their quirks, and his was he was not a very good speller. My mom would double check his spelling for him when he typed things out or wrote things out, because that was just not a quality that he had until later in life when the computer came out. With his contracted work completed, Ken bids Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk adieu. Even though his grander plans for the amusement park did not happen, he was able to earn the additional funds he needed to continue with what had become his dream project. Twig's outfit was partly designed to allow him, as a hand puppet, to be able to move about on the floor of his tower with two puppeteers under the floor. The hand of one puppeteer would be the head of Twig, the other would use rod mechanisms to operate Tweak's arms and hands. The rope he wore covered rods and the flexible seam on the floor. With his paycheck from making cave people and seahorses cashed, Ken went about planning the next phase in The Adventures of Simeon Greep. His characters had taken shape, and there was a general plot line. But Ken felt it necessary to actually build something to show potential investors. The set he chose was Tweak's castle, later known as his tower. He even called upon an old army buddy of his, Ken Griffendorf, nicknamed Griff, to help him out. Having the money to buy the right materials this time around was much different than what had occurred earlier on in the project. Ken said he wanted to build a puppet. He selected Twig. He molded the head out of clay and we created a mold of the clay. What we then did is he said, we're going to have to get some Celastic rubber and we're going to have to melt it. And I said, okay. He got the Celastic rubber. We cut it up in little tiny pieces. And he said, well, there's no point in spending a lot of money, but we need to get a double boiler set of pans, which is one pan inside of the other. Normally what you would do is you put hot water in the big pan and then you put whatever you want in the inner pan and it heats it. Well, what we did is we put reclaimed oil in because Ken didn't want to spend and the money for a brand new can of oil. I think it cost us something like 25 cents versus maybe 75 or a dollar. And we started heating up the boiling pan. We poured in the reclaimed oil and we put all the little tiny pieces of elastic rubber in the inner pan and we we're just waiting for it to melt and it started to melt. And unbeknownst to us, the reclaimed oil must have had kerosene in it or some flammable item. And all of a sudden it started on fire. Ken grabbed it and he put it underneath the water because we were cooking it right near the sink. And all of a sudden this flame shot up out of the boiler pan, hit the top of the cabinet, flashed it all the way across the apartment because apparently the fumes had been a gathering by the ceiling and Ken and I kept ducking as we were running out the door. As soon as we got out of the door, the fire department came up, which was kind of amazing. I didn't think they would be re that responsive, but apparently one of the neighbors called the fire department because they heard this huge wound. As the fire was being put out, one inquiring fireman asked what the two had been up to. Ken's response was, never use reclaimed oil as it often has kerosene in it. The next day, they returned to survey the damage. Among other problems, the kitchen cabinets from eye level up were charred. It took several weeks to repair everything. By the time Tweak's castle was built, Ken had expended his budget. With further work on props and puppets unable to happen, the set was, quite unfortunately, left to deteriorate. Robert and Griff went back to their day jobs, and Ken did as well. However, WED Enterprises, indeed the entire Disney sphere of influence, was about to be hit by an earth-shattering event. I should not try to explain Walt Disney, although one perhaps can understand the character of a man through his works. 
but I believe at least one secret of his remarkable career was that in all he did, he was not consulting opinion polls or reaching deliberately to reach a mass audience, but rather sought only to satisfy one most unusual person, Walt Disney himself. A modest man with a flat Missouri accent and few illusions about himself or anything else. What about Fairyland, you ask? He had no illusions about that. He knew by consulting only his own spirit that Fairyland is no illusion. It exists truly, somewhere within the emotional understanding of every man, woman, and child. And he satisfied the longing of every one of us to make it real. The Beatrice Daily Sun Walt Disney passed away on December 15, 1966, just 10 days after his 65th birthday. His death sent shockwaves through the company. Employees from every area were taken completely by surprise. Well, what he did, he taught me a philosophy of common sense and the philosophy of doing something you've never done before, because that was Walt. Whenever you wanted to show him something, you better make damn sure he's never seen it before in order to get him really interested in what you have to say. Always go for the next level and uh, don't be afraid to color outside the lines. So I think that was one of the things I learned from him. With their leader gone, Walt Disney's employees did what they felt he would want them to do. In other words, the show must go on. The animation department pushed themselves to complete The Jungle Book and the Imagineers decided it was finally time to bring into existence the one attraction their beloved boss had wanted in his magic kingdom from the very beginning. Disneyland's most frightfully entertaining adventure, the long-awaited Haunted Mansion, is now being furnished with spooks from all over the world. Researching ghostly homes and castles, supernatural occurrences, occult literature and psychic phenomena, the designers set out to create the kind of spine-chilling atmosphere that would attract happy haunters. Permanent residents now being assembled include 999 restless spirits, banshees, zombies, and cadaverous creatures of every description who appear and disappear at will. The San Bernardino County Sun, March 21st, 1969. And there's an effort in the late 50s to create a walkthrough version of the Haunted Mansion that in part might even use the universal monsters such as Dracula and Frankenstein that goes nowhere. And then there's another effort in the early 60s to create an attraction that's going to be very special effects heavy. And then after Walt's passing, there is an effort that finally produces the mansion that we know. But one of the big questions about the mansion is how then is a ride that's scary going to be integrated into a place that's mainly focused on joy and exuberance. I worked on it for five years on and off. And Walt would use different people from animation to come up with ideas. They all came up with little cartoon characters, kind of funny stuff. Then I thought to myself, no, this is not what the Haunted Mansion should be. A Haunted Mansion should have something that's really spooky and scary because it's a Haunted Mansion. And I remember one time Walt did mention, he, we were in a meeting with him. He says, well, you know, people love to get scared. And that's what drove me to do the Museum of the Weird and work on stuff that was a little strange. It was a crazy time frame. In fact, Yale and I did a mock-up of all the illusions that we were inventing, and we showed it to Walt on a sound stage, and he just loved it. And Ken was working on finishing figures, making sure that all the happy and not-so-happy ghosts looked their best. But he's also paying attention to the special effects and how the implemented illusions enhanced the overall rider experience. These are the additional skills and resources he's taking with him after his Imagineering days are over. From the first terror-producing words whispered by the ghost host welcoming all foolish mortals to the eerie strains of grim-grinning ghosts, the Haunted Mansion keeps its promise to be a delightfully dreary adventure suitable for every age. Adding to the bedlam are fluttering bats, phantom musicians, accompanying dancers drifting above a ballroom floor, ghosts that materialize and disappear at will, marble statues that come to life, and even a group of hitchhiking ghosts playfully seeking a seat right next to visitors. The Desert Sun. In the end, the Haunted Mansion would be a combination of fright and fun, with the split coming in the attic during Madame Leota's seance. Some Imagineers at the time considered it an inconsistent story, but time would tell. The Haunted Mansion became one of Disneyland's most popular attractions. At least nine of the Imagineers who worked on the Haunted Mansion would see their names immortalized as anagrams upon tombstones scattered around the cemetery portion of the attraction. Two of the select few were Chuck Fuson and his son-in-law, Ken Forsey. 
Even Goldilocks, cold porridge notwithstanding, would love the bears at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom. That's because never before in the history of show business has such a conglomeration of cavorting, carefree carnivores engaged in such frantic, furry frivolity and madcap, mirthful merriment. The bare truth is that this is the zaniest troupe of musical performers ever to set paws on a stage. Only the Disney imagination can conjure up such an obstreperous contingent of frustrated hams as the 18 bears, not to mention a raccoon, buffalo, stag, and moose, who star in the country bear jamboree, the Orlando Sentinel. Walt Disney World, The Florida Project opened its doors to the Magic Kingdom on October 1, 1971. One journalist wrote that the new park suspended disbelief. It was incredible, unbelievable, and beyond the imagination. It was pure, downright American fun, and Walt would have loved every minute of it. Soon after opening, it became clear that the Country Bear Jamboree was so popular with park visitors that not only would Disneyland receive its own version of the show, the original theme park would also get its own themed area focused around it. This would be one of Ken's final projects with WED. Like some other Imagineers, he felt that with the opening of the new Florida resort, his promise to his dearly departed boss had been kept. He also was one of many who did not like where the company was heading. It was an entirely different company after Walt passed, and it was taken over by uh, management, and dealing with management was kind of a nightmare. The whole continuity of the company was no longer there. After nearly 10 years of working in the model shop, Ken said farewell to WED Enterprises. He had started as a 26-year-old bachelor just out of the service and was exiting as an experienced artist on the cusp of middle age with a family. And of course, there was that puppet show of his, its plot growing and evolving. Aboard their sailing ship, Greep and Grubby are following a course charted on an ancient treasure map that has been in Greep's family for many generations. As they near land, they hear a distant rumbling sound which they assume to be thunder. Soon they sight what looks like a flock of geese approaching. As they get nearer, it turns out that the geese are really cannonballs, but it's too late. Several of the cannonballs hit the ship and it immediately begins to sink. Greep retrieves the map and the two abandon ship. Thus began the adventures of Simeon Greep. By 1972, Ken had brainstormed a list of 39 episodes to his puppet show. He knew that the core of the story would be Greep and Grubby in search of a treasure in an unnamed land where they would meet the hermit inventor Newton Gimmick. Together, the trio would deal with the inept villain Tweeg and his bounder sidekick LB, traversing the continent in Gimmick's Project X, or, as he called it, an air sloop. And Newton gimmick, which I really love, was to build this hot air balloon. So Ken designed the hot air balloon, and I said, no, that's not what he would do. Newton gimmick would think that the gondola should be on top of the balloon. And then as it slowly moves up in the air, it slowly rotates down because it's heavy, and the gondola is on the bottom. So he liked that idea, so he used it. It's really interesting that even so early on, Ken has the basic idea of the storyline down. He's still years away from finalizing what we know to be the plot, but the beginnings of it all are present. Gimmick shoving sticks into the Bounder's mouths, and especially Tweeg being the world's worst shot. These are staple gags that we take for granted, but knowing they're present early on shows Ken's got the nature of his characters pretty much set. After Tweeg steals Greep's treasure map, Leaving a phony one in its place, the trio find themselves flying over the dark forest, forced to land after running out of fuel. It is here that they are taken prisoner by the Narks, fierce little armor-clad warriors who keep the rest of the inhabitants of the forest in constant fear. No one remembers a time when the Narks didn't reign over the dark forest with an iron hand. There seems to be no good reason for them to maintain such a military existence. There is certainly no chance that anyone would ever try to oppose or overthrow them and an invasion is most unlikely. It must be that they simply don't know any other way of life. And they're just nasty little things, even to each other. In one scene, the heroes witness the narcs punish their own kind by tying dissenters up so sunshine can burn into them, causing a terrible amount of pain. What's really cool is that the origins of the narcs, who are described as monkey-like, comes from a random piece that Ken created for Artistry and Dimension, 
there's a mask on one page in the catalog described as an owl monkey. Just from the headdress the face has on shows it was sort of a prototype for what became these creatures. To achieve unique voices for the narcs, a voiceman reads the lines of dialogue and they are recorded on tape. The tape is then played back in reverse so that the words are all backwards. The voiceman memorizes and learns to imitate the reverse dialogue and another recording is made. Of course, it's not possible to imitate perfectly a reversed voice, so when the second recording is reversed, the lines will be right again, but the voice will be backwards. This will give a most unusual quality to the voices and should fit the narcs perfectly. Before escaping the dungeons of the narcs, the trio meet the being known as Fearful, whose real name will not remain his by the time Ken finalizes his story. They promise to help him find his way back home. As outlined by Ken, the following episodes feature Tweeg returning to the story and dressing up as a little old lady to ascertain whether he has the authentic treasure map. He eventually plummets off a cliff to his presumed death, only to be rescued by a giant bird named Bloofer, who cannot quite seem to get the would-be villain's name right. Meanwhile, the heroes, when not interacting with Tweeg, are traveling aimlessly. They interact with beings called Tilipans, helping them defeat a faux fire demon. Then they actually do reunite Fearful with his parents, and after consulting with a philosopher named Max, they realize that Kimmick's navigation skills aren't worth much, because they're actually closer to Kimmick's house than to where the map says the treasure is buried. Ken saw this plot device, the trio returning to Gimmick's Valley halfway through their journey, as a unique touch of realism. It would be the sort of unexpected disappointment that real life has a way of dishing out. He also makes note that since he'll have spent a great deal of time and money creating the sets and scenery, utilizing them for just an episode or two wouldn't be cost effective. But Ken intends for the locations to change along with the seasons. He's even taking into account the possible airing dates for his puppet show, should it make it to television. He figures that since episodes 11 through 15 will air during the holiday season, they should take place during the winter. For reasons unknown, only 11 of the planned 39 episodes were outlined. Ken intended for the trio to reunite with Fearful and revisit Max and the Tilipons once spring came, but beyond that, there is nothing more. Even the nature of the treasure eludes him. Ken knew it would lie at the top of a mountain within an ancient lost city, but in 1972, Ken had no idea what it actually was. None of the treasure seekers actually know what the treasure really is. The map is labeled merely, Fabulously Lost Treasure. On the lower left hand corner of the map is a large X and the words dig here. So, the treasure becomes everything to everybody, each one imagining it to be whatsoever suits his fancy. Through the city are rich embellishments of gold and jewels, but if one is to look beyond all of the glitter, there is another treasure to be found. For there are strange writings that lead to a secret place where only a great wisdom will be able to unlock the door to the greatest treasure of all. Come dream with me tonight Let's go to far off places And search for treasures bright Come dream with me tonight Let's build a giant airship And sail into the sky Let's watch the ground so far below Let's watch the birds as they fly by The butterflies in springtime Will lead us on our way Exploding dandelions Will brighten summer's day And if our dream's a good one And if our dream is right then imagination can be real if we will dream tonight. Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's meet a lovely princess and stand before a king. Let's dream a great adventure and let us live that magic dream. The orange leaves of autumn will crackle in the air. In winter, tiny 
snowflakes will sparkle everywhere and if our dreams a good one and if we see it through then the wondrous dream we dream tonight someday just might come true